Cockney, received pronunciation, Western accents remain rotic. Emily doesn't drop H. Who, who and who sound like who. He was a local lad, actually Shakespeare. Bob's got a picture of a big old dog sat on top of his shed. Is that mushroom soup? How far is the spa? She stood in middle at pub at end at bar. Poppy's a better baker. Accents in English are divided between North and South, and it all hinges on whether you say cut or cut, bath or bath. Let's start with cut. Everyone rhymed cut, hut, put and hood until about the 1600s, when the short U vowel split in Northern dialects, with some words going to a and others to u. In the North, this split never happened. So hut rhymes with put, and rush rhymes with bush. Back in the South, another development that happened later in the 17th century was the trap-bath split. It isn't always easy to predict which words are affected by the split. Doing maths in a brass bath can be a gas for a lass, as long as she grasps any asps which pass through. It's Alaska, not Alaska, although I'd ask about Nebraska. I hope one day we find the answer to cancer. It's plaster, but plastic, although I have heard plastic and elastic. They're both pretty drastic, ghastly, if you ask me. The accent known as RP, received pronunciation or standard Southern British, is solidly southeastern in origin. Although it's also used by middle class speakers across England and to an extent Wales. Phonetician Daniel Jones first described the accent in 1917. He identifies it as that most usually heard in everyday speech in the families of Southern English persons whose menfolk have been educated at the great public boarding schools. By the way, public school in the UK means private school. The accent has changed quite a bit since then, and the conservative variety heard in newsreels and early television is now only used by elder members of the royal family, ageing aristocrats and retired colonels. The most marked changes have been a move from I to E in the happy vowel. So we're now very, very happy instead of being very, very happy. An Englishman's castle is now their home rather than being one's home, where the black cat once sat on the mat. The rat now chats with a cat in a hat. The traditional London accent, known as Cockney, has now spread far beyond the capital to become the main working class accent of the South East. TH fronting results in the th sound in other dialects being replaced by a f sound, 30,000 feathers on a thrush's throat, and the th sound coming out as v, but only in the middle of words and at the end. So this or that, I'm not bothered. T between vowels and at the ends of words is famously rendered as a glottal stop, so we'll get you'll never put a better bit of butter on your knife. Other voiceless stops get glottalized between vowels, giving paper and baker, for example. Like most regional accents in England, H's are long gone. They're over the hill. They've had it. In Hartford, Hereford and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. The or vowel in full splits in Cockney, so we get full, tall, sauce, gulk, and bald, but word finally, for, tor, saw, gore, and bored. Grammatical endings don't count for this, so bald and bored, which sound the same in most varieties of English, don't in Cockney. I lost my dart board, and now I'm bored. Click pause while I grab the cat's paws. All kind of fun things happen with L's. If you get an L sound without a vowel after it, well, basically, you don't get an L sound. This is called L vocalization. That means the L turns into a vowel. The exact vowel it becomes depends on the one before. Bill, bell, owl, carl, tall, tall, bowl, rule, etc. This causes some vowels to merge. So RP, all, ul, ul, all merge with the fault vowel. It's your fault if the fault falls you for a fault. Eel, ill and eel go to ill. So real, real and real all sound the same. How did Phil feel in real? Was it a thrill for real? Al, ale, owl merged to owl. So vowel 
vowel and vowel all sound the same. Vowels, vowels are a vowed fret. Ol, ol, ol go to ol, giving col and col, dull and dull. Jump in the water, water and pull, pull from the pool. Dry his towel with his towel, you can't fail. Over the last 20 years, Cockney has been pushed out of its traditional East End of London home by an accent called Multicultural London English. This has some things in common with Cockney, like glottal stops and T-fronting in some contexts. In others, th is pronounced t as in ting. Unlike Cockney, Emily doesn't drop H. It also exhibits quite extreme goose fronting, whereby the U vowel in words like goose, food, huge and view is pronounced quite far forward in the math. The near and square diphthongs become monothongs, so we get beer, here, there, bear. The price vowel is quite distinctive in MLE, where birds can fly high in the sky. The k and g consonants are pronounced quite far back in the math, so you can go out and get a kite. By the way, if you don't want to miss out on future videos, please click subscribe here in the corner. Finally leaving London and heading west, we start to hear more conservative features as a reminder of what many Southern English accents used to sound like before London speech overwhelmed them either in the form of RP or Cockney. Western accents remain rhotic, with a retroflex R not dissimilar to the one we hear in North America. Other distinctive features of West Country accents are the fronting of the mouth vowel, so how now brown cow, and the rounding of the price vowel as in I have a nice life. Now you may think that merges with choice but it doesn't. So boy and boy are still different. The trap bath split hasn't happened for everybody to the same extent. So for some speakers trap, bath and even palm have the same vowel. For others there's just a difference in length but not quality. So short a uh, in trap, but long in bath and palm. Moving back eastwards, skirt in London, we leave the motorway system behind as we venture into East Anglia. Now, some people tend to confuse this accent with the West Country, mainly because here too, the price diphthong is rounded. The big difference here though, is that East Anglian accents are not rhotic so the as are only pronounced when there's a vowel after them. There's no H drop in here either. What does get dropped a lot though, is a little thing called a Yod. Now Yod is a Hebrew letter used to represent the Y sound. Here we're using it to talk about the Y sound you get before the long U vowel in certain contexts like university and euphoria. Accents of English treat this Yod in different ways when it comes after a consonant. North American speakers drop it after alveolar stops and nasals. So tune, duke, and new. Cockney agrees with this, but just for nasals, so they say new too. In East Anglia, yods are dropped after every consonant. So food sounds like food, booty like booty, coot like coot, who, who, and who sound like who. We went to Kew Gardens, there was a huge coup to get in. I'd expected fewer people, but it was a beautiful day. When we got home, the cat was mooing, so we fed him, and I pulled up a poo, put my phone ringer on moot, and listened to some music. Bear and bear sound the same. So you have to watch what you ask for if you go to a bear garden or a pub. Normally in England, you wouldn't say, can I have a bear, please? It's more common to ask for a point and then the specific name of the bear that you want. There's a merger between goot and goose vowels, so you wash your hands with soup and water, sail around in boots and try not to step on the poop's twos. East Anglian has a very distinctive rhythm, seen as how the short vowels are very short and the long vowels are quite long. As we head northwest up the M40 from London towards Birmingham, we cross the linguistic border between north and south, the isogloss between strut and strut. From here on in, our cups will be cups and our buses will be buses. Continuing along the road, we cross the second border where our path becomes our path. We have reached the West Midlands. 
Being close to so many isoglosses can do strange things to people. Someone from near here once told me that for him, glass and glass were two different words. A glass is something you drink out of, and glass is the material it's made from. By the way, if you're enjoying this so far, don't forget to give me a like and drop me a comment. That helps other people see the video, and I always try to reply to all the comments. Birmingham is one of the great cities which grew exponentially in the Industrial Revolution. Between 1760 and 1820, Britain underwent an unprecedented transformation in the way the people lived and worked. One of the changes was the growth of great industrial cities, which attracted workers from neighbouring regions. As workers moved into the city, each speaking the accent of the village or town of their birth, accent levelling started happening. People adapt the way they speak to make themselves more easily understood in their new environment. What develops is an organic merging of all the accents into a new one. The new way of speaking becomes a badge of identity and belonging in the community. That's how we get city accents that are markedly different to speech in the surrounding towns and villages. The Birmingham accent is northern in terms of strut and bath. The price vowel is rounded and can sometimes sound similar, if not identical, to choice. The happy vowel is E, although some speakers use E, actually. The fleece vowel is very distinct, as in to be and not to be. He was a local lad, actually, Shakespeare. Staff is just down the road from Birmingham. Something you don't find in Birmingham speech is NG coalescence. People in London started doing this at the end of the 16th century, so in words like fang and sing, they stopped saying the g at the end and were left with just the velar nasal ng. This didn't always happen in the middle of words, which is why most accents of English have finger with a g, but singer without one. In Birmingham, finger and singer rhyme, and fang still has its g. Another city that grew massively during the Industrial Revolution is Liverpool, which changed from a small fishing village into one of the greatest port cities in the world after the 1700s. People moved here not just from the surrounding area, but also from the rest of England, Wales, Ireland, and as far afield as Africa, India and China. People from Southern Ireland are said to have had the greatest influence, although unlike Ibanian English, Liverpool doesn't have a rounded price diphthong and isn't rotic. By the late 19th century, the Liverpool accent had become totally distinct from the surrounding Lancashire and Cheshire accents. The earliest reference to the accent that came to be known as Scouse is from 1890. Scouse has quite prominent goose fronting, which we last saw in MLE. Some words that belong to the foot word set in other dialects use the goose vowel here. Book, cook and luke are typically pronounced with the goose vowel rather than that of foot. So, give us a look at your cookbook. This creates minimal pairs, such as look and look, book and book. Stop consonants often have friction after them, so p, t, k get to be p, t, k, and b, d, g, b, z, g. Bob's got a picture of a big old dog sat on top of his shed. Sometimes only the friction is heard, so bach can sound like bach. There's a lot less glossalization in Liverpudlian than there is in other accents of English. T sounds in certain words, after a short vowel, can become a flapped r sound. At the end of words, it can be a light h. Have you got any change? Yeah, but not a lot. The square nurse merger may have come about as a result of Irish influence. In this way, words like fur and fur, bird and bird, curd and curd sound the same. The vowel quality varies with individuals, so some blonde people might have fur air and others fair air. There seems to be a gender difference in the goat's vowel in Liverpool, where people who identify as men wear coats on boats, whereas women tell jokes about popes using a vowel from the poshest version of RP. Moving out of Liverpool into Lancashire, we enter an area where isoglosses are like spaghetti and pronunciation changes every few miles. There are some traits that many of these accents have in common. The boat vowel is monothongal or, which can sound similar to RP boat. Face is also monothongal, but some words from the face set are pronounced with the dress vowel, for example, tech, breck and mech. It could be argued that these aren't features of the accent, but are instead surviving dialect forms of these verbs. 
I once heard a young girl of about 10 correcting her younger brother. He'd said, don't do that, you'll break it. And she replied, it's not break, it's break. I wonder if she thought she was correcting his grammar or his pronunciation. The nurse vowel is distinctive in some words, which are pronounced with a schwa sound. For example, work, first. Mouth can sometimes have a distinctive pronunciation, enabling folk to go round and round the roundabout when they're out and about. Final PT and K sounds at the end of sentences could be pronounced as ejectives. These are sounds found in some Bantu languages as well as Amharic and many languages in North America. Is this all a big plot? Is that mushroom soup? Can I have a look? The only surviving rhotic accent in Northern England is in Lancashire. The area where this still occurs has shrunk considerably since the 1950s and is now limited to an area northwest of Manchester. There's a nasal flavour to the speech of Manchester, which is another of those cities that grew up in the Industrial Revolution and developed an accent of its own. People often comment that the vowels are over-enunciated. I don't really know what that might mean. Over-enunciated from whose point of view? I can't understand you because you're speaking too clearly. One thing it might be about is the fact that many vowels, which are monothongs in surrounding accents, are quite extreme diphthongs in Manchester. By that I mean the tongue travels quite a way between the beginning and end of price, choice, mouth and goose. As you can hear, goose is fronted and diphthongized. We rediscover some features we last heard in London. For example, TH fronting in words like thing and other. The calm vowel is quite far forward. How far is the spa? Don't start drinking lager. The last syllable of happy is often close to E. Eh. Crossing the Pennine Hills into Yorkshire, you soon discover two things. Firstly, Yorkshire is a very big place and the accent varies a lot in different parts of the county. And secondly, there isn't one clear dividing isogloss between Yorkshire and Lancashire. There's a tendency for Yorkshire folk to be further along the path of NG coalescence, so finger and singer don't rhyme. The happy vowel in Yorkshire is most likely to be I. Perhaps one of the strongest indicators is the absence of goose fronting. A Yorkshire goose has a back closing diphthong. Would you say boo to a new blue goose, or would the goose say boo to you? Boat is usually boat, but if you go to all and hear the word bert, you maybe don't know that folk are saying Bert and not Bert, which is a bloke's name. This feature is spread into the rest of the county, especially in the speech of young women. Also in all, as well as in Middlesbrough and the East Riding, the price vowel can be a long R. So we get, I was surprised she ate all five pies and then lied about it. This only happens at the end of words or before voice consonants though. Price, right, bike, wipe, etc. all have diphthongs. This distinction between price and prize also happens in eastern Texas. So you've got an excuse if you can't tell if someone's from Yorkshire or Texas. Some fun things happen to the word the in Yorkshire and other parts of northern England. It gets reduced in such a way that it's often spelt T apostrophe as in the stereotypical trouble at mill. What actually happens in pronunciation depends on the surrounding sounds. Sometimes it's a glottal stop. Did you see eagle? I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Sometimes it lengthens the preceding or following consonant. She stood in middle at pub at end at bar. The northeast of England has a distinctive accent known as Geordie, centred on the city of Newcastle. There's no H drop in here, in common with RP and MLE. Voiceless consonants are often glottalized. So for example, in happy, the P sound involves a glottal stop and closing of the lips simultaneously. The same happens with T and K. Poppy's a better baker. Talking a happy, the final vowel is E. The face and goat vowels can either be long monothongs, my goat has a pretty face, or centering diphthongs, my goat has a pretty face. The poem vowel is quite far back and sometimes rounded. Geordie hasn't had the trap bath split, though it does sometimes use a back R 
in some bath words, such as plaster and master. Unlike the majority of accents of English, Geordie doesn't have dark L's, even after vowels. Earlier on, I said that RP was used by middle class people throughout England without any regional features. In all of the areas I've talked about though, some people will vary their accent depending on the situation and the audience, moving closer to RP in more formal situations. There are also some features that can be described as Northern RP. Many speakers in the North think that the back vowel in ask and bath sounds stupid and pretentious, so they'll use the trap vowel throughout. The R in cup doesn't have the same stigma attached to it. It might still sound too southern for some people though. At the same time, having U in cup might sound too working class to them. As a compromise, some RP speakers in the north use U schwa in strut words. Having a lovely cup of tea before rushing for the bus. And that concludes our tour of the accents of England. It was far from comprehensive. There is much more variety than can fit into the time available and indeed into my own limited knowledge.